Hello there and welcome to Travels with Geordie. If this is your first visit, my name is Peter Knowles and I live on this classic wooden motor cruiser here in Victoria, British Columbia, along with the loving memory of my pup, Geordie. All the while fixing it up for some pretty major cruising someday. If that's the sort of thing you might find interesting, please consider sticking around and subscribing. I'd love to have you. So lots going on this week. Uh, carrying on with work in the panel and starting to look at connecting up the engine for an imminent start. Okay, then we'll back up into the helm. Well, we can bring a bunch of wires through now through this hole, which maybe you can see. Um, but you can imagine by the time the instrument panel goes on here, there's a lot of connections to be made under here. So I need a bit of a panel to put bus bars and stuff on. So what I'm going to do uh, right on to the surface of this big um, set of blocks that holds the steering um, mechanism, I'm going to put a piece of plywood and a little cutout for around here. And that will allow me to put um, some bus bars, some terminal strips and actually some relays. And uh, we'll get into that a little later. Beauty. Okay. Well, that creates a little uh, panel where I can put some stuff and still have access to uh, maintain the uh, steering assembly here. Cool. Love it. Okay, so this piece is going to go right in the far side here and it will support the starboard side ledger of the uh, brass instrument panel. Cool, cool. Okay, now one quick thing before I install this, as this is going to go uh, just to the right of the instrument panel, I'm going to put a USB charging plug right there. I won't bother with the boot on it because it's not a moisture environment. And I want to do this now because it'll be a lot easier to do it now than later. I'm going to say right there. This is a very nice unit because um, it's 4.8 amps high power, which is really essential for running an iPad as a navigation um, system. And it was gifted to me uh, from the um, Amazon wish list. Love it. Actually, that's in backwards. Eh, it's going to go eh, that way. Beauty. Okay. Oh, not easy on the back. Okay, let's get in under here. Oh, and that's home. I like it. And good morning. Well, we left this off yesterday after I got this little side panel in uh, with the hole for the USB charger. Really pleased with the way that works. So now I um, just have to put the remaining ledgers in to uh, look after holding up this beautiful little brass panel, which as you see, I have uh, taken the instruments back out of to make some small modification to it, mostly a couple more holes. Um, okay, so that's basically going to consist of a ledger that hangs off the bottom of here, a ledger that hangs off the bottom of there, it gets nailed to this side, nailed to this side, really not all that interesting, let's just get on with it. Okay, where were we? Okay, now for the ledger at the back, I have cut the slightest five degree chamfer on the back side because of course the panel is on a five degree slope. Now you're not gonna be able to see any of this, but I'm gonna be under here and I'm gonna attach this on here. That's, that's, that's what I'm doing. All oh, right. Love it. This piece, of course, is also beveled at five degrees. One last piece. And that's it. <laughs> does it fit? Does it fit? Oh, it sure does. I love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs>
So this edge here now needs to be eased a little bit. When I first was designing the helm, I didn't know if the panel was going to sit absolutely up and uh, pretty close to flush with this. So I left that crisp for now, but actually I needed to recess it a bit so that the switches could clear the iPad that's going to be on the inside of the cover. Uh, so I'm just going to ease this ever so slightly. And this little project officially ends woodworking for the next little while, uh, which I'm very grateful for, so I can be free of dust, at least till uh, the haul out or pretty close to it. I'm just gonna throw, as you can imagine, a little tongue oil on this and on the uh, inner panel there, and uh, move on to less dusty stuff. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. Okay then, well with the panel um, properly secured in here and that's looking great, it's time to make some final uh, changes to the actual panel before I repopulate it again. And that's a few more holes and I'll go into them in detail in just a sec. Okay, for those of you who've been following along, the panel is uh, largely complete. Looks kind of ratty here, its edge is not properly deburred. Yes, many people have suggested I get a deburring tool. I can't believe I have never owned one, but that's yet to come. Okay, but um, some small changes in the panel. Um, few people have mentioned uh, why are there only three holes here and this fourth hole, which is in the drawing, is not placed. Well, that hole, these are um, warning lights. So this is the uh, temperature, engine temperature gauge and it will have a warning light. This is the engine oil pressure gauge, it will also have a warning light. This is the uh, engine voltmeter and it will have basically the classic charge light uh, that shows a, a failure to charge. This is the depth sounder and I'm hoping to have a warning light as well as an alarm for a low depth alarm. However, I wasn't able to confirm whether or not there is a wire um, pigtail on the gauge to do that but I think there is so I'm going to drill this hole now anyway in anticipation of there being a um, alarm light possibility. Uh, down here these are the engine control switches start and stop etc. Now I had intended originally just to have the first button uh, basically ignition on uh, which would also be the preheat so you'd press this button the uh, preheat would start and all the alarms would start to sound and the panel would light up etc. Uh, then this would be the start button and this would be the stop button. Now I have to use buttons because I'm going to have two helms upstairs and down. Therefore I can't use a key because I don't want to start the engine on the lower helm and not be able to turn it off at the upper helm. So that works out fine. And there's a sequence of relay latching relays that make this work. We can talk about that later. But I'm going to change the way this works to what I had imagined I was going to do in the first place, which is five buttons, quite a row of buttons. Basically, I want to be able to turn on the ignition, in other words, um, the helm systems, without starting the buzzers and starting the preheat. Uh, if, so let's say I want to look at my uh, depth gauges. Let's say I want to look at uh, the depth gauge. I want to look at my fuel gauges. There might be some reason I want to turn the ignition on, in other words, the engine systems, without starting the buzzers. So uh, this will be an on button. This will be the preheat. This will be the start. This will be the engine flush, get into that in a second, and the last button here will be the stop button. Uh, engine flush will be a freshwater flush for the raw water intake, which will flood the raw water intake with fresh water from the domestic water system um, for when I'm going to turn the engine off and not use it again for several days or months or weeks or something like that. And it'll flush the entire raw water uh, cooling system with fresh water, uh, flushing all the salt out of it. Uh, it'll also be interesting because I can also use it to back flush the, um, the through-haul pickup in case I was to clog it with uh, some seaweed or some mud or something like that. Uh, so I'm quite, I'm quite happy with that. Okay, let's drill some holes. Oh no, there's one more! Ha <laughs> ha! This is going on forever. Um, this little kit here uh, came with the gauges and it includes a small potentiometer, uh, in other words, knob. And it is the brightness knob for all the gauges that came from Speed Hut. Um, and I'm going to put it right up here in the corner. It's a tiny little uh, classic retro style knob. I'm very happy with it actually. And so I just have to decide where that's going to go. Some holes to drill.
Okay, those two, that one, that one, we're done. is a very weak drill press. I love step drills. Beauty. Okay, so it's time to put the final, whatever this finish is on the panel. Uh, this is a 600 grit uh, sanding sponge, which will just give it an overall very scratched look. And then I'm gonna try and experiment. Uh, I'm gonna put a scotch Brite pad down and use my little cheapy hardware store mouse sander because it actually sticks to it and uh, see what that does for the next step. All right, well I've gone through the various grits of uh, 3M scotch Brite, and I am now very happy with what I've ended up with. <laughs> Some of you may not be surprised about what's coming next. First, a quick wipe down to get off any minor, 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 minor brass dust. And then, <laughs> how many of you knew that tongue oil is also a metal finish? Yes, it is. It's fantastic for sealing um, metal tools and the such um, against oxidization. So. It's an experiment. I've never used it on brass. Um, obviously, I can easily clean it off if it turns out to be a bad idea. Well, I say easily. <laughs> I'd have to remove all the gauges to do a nice job of it. But <sighs> because I'm such a believer in tongue oil, I'm going to give this a shot. All right. Let that uh, set up a little bit and give it a little rub down later. I'm very excited. Okay then, well some of you will remember that um, the new gauges I bought came with these uh, beautiful billet aluminum uh, bezels, but they're way too shiny and as a result look pretty much like plastic. So um, uh, you might have remembered that I did a little scuff with some Scotch-Brite uh, to get them to look a little better and I'm going to do all those. Okay, on from that. You might also remember that the depth gauge is a completely different line of gauges. These are the... Um, uh, speed hut gauges and this is actually a gauge uh, from video that's a uh, digital um, uh, NMEA 2000 compatible gauge very exciting we're going to go into this in detail so I want to put my spare bezel over this gauge so that they all match and if you've been following along remember that the flange is a bit too high so I'm just going to sand that flange off until this will screw back over it pretty straightforward but so I don't scratch up the bezel or the lens. Let's just put a little tape over that. Yeah, how about we put some actual tape over that? Okay, and there we go. Uh, as hack as that obviously is, it did do the job quite nicely, and now the bezel will screw uh, right down onto the remains of that flange. Cool. All right then, well, while we wait for that uh, tongue oil to set up a little bit, um, let's get back down in the bilge. Remember this beauty? Well, it's time to start connecting it up. All right then, so before we can start the engine, there's five basic systems that have to be connected up. Uh, fuel, uh, diesel, uh, supply and return, uh, the raw water, in other words, the cooling water from the ocean into the uh, heat exchanger, the um, calorifier, or the heat exchanger, which is in the fresh water cooling system, which, um, is basically going to be used to heat hot water and domestic hot water and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the electrical system of course, all the wiring for the engine and the exhaust system. Okay so ha, I've got most of the stuff to do most of that and that's the project for the next couple of days. So let's look over the engine and where all the stuff is going to connect it up. This engine is considered to be freshwater cooled. In other words it has its own integrated um, cooling system that recirculates coolant very much like a car does and here's a radiator cap for that coolant. Now it has no radiator so it has to um, somehow cool that water by some other means and that's done through this heat exchanger which uh, has seawater pumped through it. So the seawater basically comes in a seacock, in other words a valve in the bottom of the boat and I'm going to use this one temporarily although that's going to be abandoned and we'll put a nice new one in. And it goes from there into 
this pump here, which is called the raw water pump, and that pump will circulate it through all the various passages, including the transmission oil cooler to keep the transmission nice and cool, and then through the heat exchanger. And then it eventually comes popping out the back of the heat exchanger through this hose and rejoins the exhaust system, and that's what makes it a wet exhaust. Okay, um, only thing I missed was this puppy right here, which was gifted to me, which is lovely, which is called a sea strainer. So before the raw water uh, from the ocean uh, comes into the raw water pump down here, it will pass through this sea strainer, which is basically just a little basket strainer, which will pick out things like fish and mussels and very small creatures. All right, so the next system is the calorifier circuit. This uh, 5 8 hose barb here and it's matching return up here or this may actually be a supply I don't know which is which um, is equivalent to the heater uh, core circuit in a car in other words hot uh, engine water will pass between these two and I'm going to plumb it through this lovely silicone hose to this lovely flat plate uh, heat exchanger which will be down there somewhere um, so I will be able to extract that heat uh, through domestic um, uh, coolant, another circuit that will go through eventually a Wabasto diesel furnace, uh, probably an electric heater, and then the uh, hot water heater, <coughs> or just the water heater, as some people might say. The system is fuel, so if I squeak your way down here, I think you can probably see these two 3 8 barb fittings, and if you've been following along, you remember that I put them on there. There are the supply and return for the fuel system, and they'll be plumbed uh, through a pair of these beautiful Raycors. This one was gifted to me, thank you very much, over the Amazon wish list. And they'll sit right, oh, if I can just get my hand on these properly, they'll sit right about here. And uh, the two of them will be here along with the various valving and things for that. The reason for that is that this side of the sole opens up very easily and I can get quick access to them should there be a problem. And of course they'll be fed from the two fuel tanks. One will be over there and the other directly underneath me here. And they've been ordered and they're on their way. And they're very expensive. The next system is electrical wiring and if you've been following along you knew that I abandoned the original wiring harness that came with the engine for a number of reasons we won't get into it right now but it has to be replaced and there's quite a few more wires uh, going to go onto the engine than originally anticipated by Beta Marine. Uh, obviously we have uh, wires to the alternator, we have wires to the um, preheat uh, which is the, the glow plugs, we have wires to the shutoff solenoid, we have wires to the start, which is over on the other side. But then of course we have sensors, we have wires to the temperature sensors, the oil pressure sensors, the transmission oil pressure sensors, and there's going to be an exhaust temperature sensor. In addition, there'll be um, uh, oil pressure switches as well as a temperature switch for warning lights and buzzers, as most boats have. So there's quite a lot of wiring to go onto the motor. And the final system is exhaust, and by far the most complex because, well, it goes from here all the way to the back of the boat through a few loops and bends. So basically the exhaust comes out the back of the heat exchanger here, or basically the exhaust manifold, and you'll notice it's missing any sort of exhaust pipe. Well, that's it here. Now again, if you've been following along, this is considered the exhaust elbow. I think I need a tripod. Okay, that's better. I can use both hands. So the exhaust elbow, or a rise, or some people might call it, uh, bolt to the back of the manifold and uh, this is hot dry exhaust but at this point here I mentioned the cooling water is coming out of the back of the engine well it, this pipe attaches to here and in here this is a Siamese pipe basically the inner pipe is the exhaust pipe just as you see here the outer pipe begins at this point and is filled with the um, raw water uh, cooling water which is now hot ish uh, it's not as hot as it's going to be because so that enters this stream as a spray all the way around the outside and that will cool the exhaust uh, significantly in the next few inches and from this point on this can be rubber hose so this will be two inch rubber hose from here traveling backwards now just a quick word on this you notice this piece of pipe is new if you've been following along you already know that i had this piece modified because when i first bought this i bought it as a high rise riser because i wanted this to be as high as possible and it came up to about here and down but the pipes went straight up here and that didn't make much sense because it meant this hose would have been up in above the sole so i had them put this 90 on they did a lovely job of that and then i decided i wanted it even higher so i had an extension welded into here very economically uh, at beta marine here in victoria and they did a lovely lovely job of it so this now sits 
right here and the top of this is three and a half inches below the bottom of the sole which is perfect that's enough that I can put some heat shields and some insulation and it won't be a problem now the reason you want this as high as possible is because the great risk with having a wet exhaust system on a boat is that water will get back into the uh, exhaust manifold and thus uh, into the head and into the cylinders and make a real mess you've heard me mention that before so that's why this uh, water injection happens past the highest point in other words there's effectively no way water can get from here back up hill and through to there well the other thing is the higher this is the less likely that that's going to happen because water will drain away by gravity and that's why this is uh, was extended as high as possible okay so from here as i said it goes to two inch rubber hose from there it's going to move on to this uh, rather spiffy if not beautifully tidy looking thing um also centec good brand which is just an adapter between two inch hose and three inch hose because the rest of the exhaust system including this lovely centec lift muffler is all three inch the reason it's all three inches because i bought it all when i was going to put the perkins engine in which required a three inch exhaust so I'm kind of overbuilting in the exhaust department, but I'm not too worried about it. So anyway, as I said, it's going to go through this uh, muffler, which is going to be down underneath the sole in this corner, and then to the back of the boat through a long three inch uh, rubber hose. We'll get into that in much greater detail quite soon, I think. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is replace the lagging on the dry part of the exhaust system because this is actually going to be very, very hot and this provides a little bit of thermal insulation. In the old days, this probably would have been asbestos. I'm going to assume it isn't. So um, I've never done this before, but um, I've seen what it looks like when it's done. So I'm going to wrap it around as tightly as possible and uh, it has effectively no stretch. So hopefully... That won't be a problem. There we go. That will do quite nicely. Now I have no idea how you're supposed to finish this off, but I'm going to put some wire around it for now. This is only galvanized wire. I need to find some stainless, but this will do for the meantime. All right, so this is pretty straightforward, basically out of the sea strainer and into the, let's remove the cap there, um, raw water pump. And I'm going to say a nice radius on there would look just about like that. Okay, a little shot of my favorite lanolin um, fluid film on here, which will make this a lot easier to get on and off if that ever had to happen. Now, normally this would be a uh, double clamped and it will be uh, eventually, but for now I can only find enough clamps to put one on each and we'll fix that up shortly. Beauty. Now I'm going to attach um, to this sketchy through hull before I attach to the other side of the C strainer because I don't know if this even works. So I'd rather not open this valve uh, with nothing on it because water will come gushing out of here. But if I put this hose on and seal it properly, I can hold the other end of the hose up above sea level and there's no chance water can come uh, gushing out of it, but I can test it. I need a little of this fluid film on there to get that to really flow on that. There we go, that should be good. Okay, so in principle, if I open this valve and this end of the hose is lower than the water level, water will come out of here. And for, if for some reason I can't close the valve again and I'm in trouble, all I have to do is raise this above sea level and we're going to be okay. Are we all ready for this? This has a latch on it. Water should come out of here once I open this valve. And there it is. Nice. Now water should stop when I close the valve. Very good. Nice. So we have at least an operational ball valve. Not exactly a proper seacock, but it'll get me to the hull out where I can replace it properly. Okay then, and to make absolutely sure that this through hull is as clear as possible, I'm going to use this 
lovely leaky garden god fix that up uh to blast pressure down back out through the through hole and that will blow anything out that happens to be accumulating around the mouth of it so uh first i'll just open the through hole water will come out put this on here give it a good there we go give it a good little blast turn that off turn this off and i'm gonna look out the window see if there's any flotsam coming up okay so now i can be reasonably assured that that through hull is adequate for at least the trip to haul out and a couple of clamps for good measure these are absolutely temporary because of course this will all be redone at the haul out and finally to prime the system this may have to be reprimed a few times as we begin to start the engine but at least I'll get started. There we go. One of the nice things about these clear topped uh, sea strainers is that you can see the water come gushing in when it's running. So all I have to do is lift this section of the sole and I can see that I've got cooling water running properly. Okay, what's next? Okay, what's next is this plate heat exchanger. Um, now, if you're not familiar with these, uh, this basically is just a bunch of um, stainless steel plates um, with gaps between them and they're brazed together with copper so this fitting and this fitting are together and this fitting and this fitting are together but they don't cross over so the hot water from the engine will go in here out here and the water that I want to heat will go in here and out here so Okay, now where do I put this? All right then, well after an extraordinary long period of, well, yes, analysis paralysis, I have not concluded a spot to put this, so I'm gonna defer it. Uh, yes, I'm just gonna short circuit um, these two fittings for now, which will be just fine. Um, the engine won't know any different, and it'll be operational, and it'll be the simplest thing I can do for now. I can't actually make use of the heat on this yet until I've installed the rest of that system. So, simple, simple. With that side on, let's make a lovely loop with this lovely red silicone hose. Once you uh, switch to using silicone hose, you'll never ever go back. Okay. And on. All right, well with that hose on, we can now fill the cooling system, uh, which is exciting. Um, the Beta Marine manual calls for a coolant ratio of between 30 and 50% coolant, uh, no more than 50%. Um, so I'm going to opt for 50%, it's just simpler somehow, and um, would have the highest level of corrosion protection, which is something I'm very interested in. Now of course, I won't be able to confirm I get all the air out of this system uh, until it starts, uh, but let's get started anyway. All right then, well my back's just about had it. So I'm gonna use the balance of today to go up on the bridge deck and sit in the sun and burnish these remaining uh, bezels for the gauges. Good good use of my time. So that tomorrow we can repopulate the uh, dash panel for the last time and start to wire some stuff up. Fun, fun. And welcome to the Travels with Jordy Beer of the Week, live from Victoria on this beautiful, like summer day. Okay, we're going back to uh, one of our very, very local breweries, uh, Moon Underwater, for their Tranquility California IPA. It's got a picture of an old Volkswagen bus on it. I'm actually one of the original van lifers. I lived in Toronto in a Volkswagen bus for about a year. Um, Volkswagen buses were my thing for a long, long time until I got too sick of the rust. So let's see what we think of this. Oh, what an incredible week it's been, and you've got a few episodes coming up. I have so much footage because I'm having to catch up on so much stuff that we're looking at at least one bonus episode over the next day or so, possibly two. Okay, to California. Oh, man, that is so good. Really good. This actually reminds me of my favorite hazy... It's not quite hazy IPA I ever had when I was on the road trip with my daughter in San Francisco. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, got to start off with last week's uh, t-shirt winner. 
uh, was Tony Simmons. So Tony, get a hold of me, and we'll make sure you get your uh, Travels with Jordy T-shirt. Um, Got to thank two. Uh, three new uh, patrons that came on in the last little while and I'm so grateful to uh, Almighty Unks I think you'll know who you are uh, Almighty Unks all one word uh, Paul uh, Jehogan Jehogan I hope I pronounced that correctly and Bert Flora uh, thanks to you all for coming aboard it really means a lot to me mm. and from PayPal uh, Daniel uh, Beastie uh, Beattie and uh, Piotr Kowalik. Kowalik. I'm having a terrible time here. Anyway, hopefully uh, that is relatively close. Uh, thanks to you both as well. I mm. um, want to talk a little bit about the t-shirts. And in my case, a sweatshirt. I can't take this thing off. I absolutely love it when I'm not getting dirty. Um, what an incredible uh, support I've had through it. Uh, t-shirts are selling very, very well. And uh, I hope you're all enjoying them. Those of you who have got them yet, maybe one or two. Um, very, very grateful. And of course, so terribly grateful to Dave for his support and making it all happen. So cheers to you again, uh, Dave O'Malley, for your help in making this happen. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, a um, little bit of news. Uh, those of you who've been following along and have a calendar, uh, know that I was to haul out uh, less than a week from now. And I've postponed it. Uh, the truth is, my back isn't too bad, but I have a general physical demise of some sort. It's just very hard uh, to get much work done, and I'm very weak, my legs especially. It probably has something to do with uh, having been in bed for over two weeks. So I got to get that back a little bit. So I, anyway, I've postponed the haul out, uh, the next available slot at the only yard I would go to, which is Vector Marine in Sydney, um, is for May 31st. I know, May 28th. Uh, which is you know well over a month away that's fine there's lots to do I'll get lots done um, but um, I think I'll be in much better shape to be able to do the kind of work I need to do for that and that brings me to this week's word of the week which is relief because as soon as I made that decision I felt such a feeling of relief uh, I can just get done what I need to get done and um, get ready for the haul out proper so cheers see you tomorrow